Hello. Hi. <laughs> okay, I <laughs> think we are. We're connected. So artists we're... from the beginning of time have been history's greatest recorders. Join us today at Charlotte Munkerberg Library's Engage 2020 for our art and activism series as we offer a glimpse into a few artists who have shared the talents and even lives to create social and civic change. Our first artist to be interview interviewed today is Renzo Ortega. Renzo provides us a glimpse into his creative approach as he offers the viewers a chance to dive into the Latin American experience in America. Through Renzo's work, we will examine the parallels and cycles of the history of displacement of families, culture, and identity in America, and the pursuit to pursue the pursuit to preserve one's sense of identity. Since we're talking about identity, I just want to go ahead and get started by introducing myself. My name is Omar Ramirez. Um, I am Mexican American, and I'm going to go ahead and let uh, my co-host introduce herself. Hi, um, my name is Rana Sobe. Um, I was born in Egypt, but I moved to the States um, when I was five. My family is from Egypt, um, but we wanted to take the time to identify ourselves because we noticed that um, uh, and so your work deals with uh, identity. And so I know a lot of times, you know, other people may identify you, but we wanted to ask you, how do you identify? Um, okay, let me, okay, I'm ready, I'll see. All right, um, it's very complex because it depends of the context, no? Mm -hmm. So in Peru, uh, I'm an artist from the city, from Lima. No, I'm very different from the artists that are from Cusco or from the Amazons. No, I'm from Lima. I'm Limeño. I'm a city guy. Right, right. Uh, but also, uh, when I go to Lima, I'm not anymore an artist from Lima. I'm an artist that lives in the United States. No, uh, that has been working in the United States for over 20 years, so I'm not anymore in Lima. In the context of the United States, of course, I am an immigrant, uh, but here I have been categorized as Latino artist, or Latin artist, or Latin American mm -hmm. artist, or a Latinx artist, etc., etc., or local artist, no? <laughs> local artist, right. no? yeah, local artist. Uh, so I, I I want to say that I like to play local, no? Uh, right now yeah. I live in Carboro, North Carolina, yeah. so I'm local in Carboro, North Carolina. But uh, it's important to embrace all the contributions and history that not only Latinos have been doing in the United States, but also immigrants. No, uh, so definitely, um, I am an immigrant artist. Yeah, I am an immigrant artist, and in a in no matter no matter what, uh, I travel to Honduras, invited by the USA Department of State mm -hmm. as a, an American artist to bring the USA culture to Honduras and to be a juror in a painting biennial and to talk about uh, American culture. So that is a proof that our contributions are important for the process of the development of society and culture. Right. So who I am, I don't know yet. <laughs> I know, it's a definitely complicated question. Depends the- You take the, into account, no, sorry. <laughs> the, the, depends the, the size of the check. Right. <laughs> That's true. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. But I, uh, I am a painter. No, I have another. Uh, I have other friends. They're like, oh, uh, I am a, I am a contemporary artist. Oh, I am, a, right. I am multimedia, multi. Uh, I don't know, neo, neo mediums artist. No, I am a painter. I am a painter. Yeah. Period. I experiment with other medias, yes. But also I am a musician. Now people ask me, oh, are you a musician or are you a painter? I was like, I, can, can I be both? Why not, no? Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I play music professionally. You know, I have a discography. Mm -hmm. No, I am a musician. I write songs, but also I am a painter. The difference is the credentials I have. I right. have a classical academic training 
in painting and an MFA in painting. In music, uh, I don't have that. Right. You know, so it's, it's yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's important. <laughs> don't be shy. Ask me questions. Uh, <laughs> oh my. Do you oh, want yeah, me to sorry. go ahead? Oh. I know it's important for us to define ourselves because of how often institutions of power will identify and label marginalized peoples. I know that your answer that you gave us was definitely complex because it definitely depends on the context of like who's applying like the label to you or depending on where you're at. Because I know you mentioned like when you're in Peru, you know, you're from Lima, so you're a, many, you're a city person over there. But then like when you come in the context of the United States, you're viewed as like an American per se. Um, I just wanted to see what your thoughts were about that. Yeah, it's, it's funny, you know, I used to work uh, at a very, uh, very nice and great art organization here in Carboro that is called the Art Center. Mm -hmm. And I was working there in the box office, also teaching, but uh, the main of the hours that I worked there, I was in the box office, you know, dealing with visitors and people selling tickets, giving information, mm -hmm. etc. <laughs> and, and was this lady, you know, this lady that show up, no nice lady, no like a typical American lady from North Carolina. No? Yeah. So right. I was like, hi, hello. I was like, hi, and she said to me, "Wow, I love your accent. Where are you from?" And I was oh like, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, <laughs> "I was like, I'm from Peru," and she right. was like, "No, but you doesn't look Inca." Wow. Wow. And I, I, and I, and I told her, where right. are you? F I told her, where are you from? She said to me, oh, I am American. Oh, you doesn't look Navajo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah, that, that, with, with me having, I don't know, it's, uh, it's funny. Uh, those, those things didn't happen in, in New York at all. Right. At all. Uh, I have a kid and my kid is very blonde because it looks like the mom that is blonde. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of times I have been in the playground with my kid. And uh, because Carboro is a very progressive and liberal bubble, right. you know, they were like, oh, wow, it's awesome that you are working as a babysitter. Oh my gosh. And I was like, uh, oh, uh, hello. Uh, <laughs> like, hello, hello, <laughs> diversity, multiracial families exist. <laughs> hello. <laughs> you get no. that a lot in progressive areas, right? Yes. They yeah, just exactly. have progressive yeah. areas. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I get that a lot. No, so I, I, I deal with that. O obviously, mm -hmm. obviously, that, that bothers me, no, bothers me. And sometimes it's very complicated. But uh, I try to, in some way, make a um, take advantage and profit mm -hmm. of that situation. Right. No, because also helps me to to uh, to enter to a spaces like a mm -hmm. caballo de Troya, like a Trojan horse. Right. Right. Definitely take advantage. Yeah. No yeah. Trojan horse, and and, uh, and because. Um, yeah, I, I believe in culture and I, and I believe that our representation must be part of the conversation, not from, but because it's, it's very common in the organizations that, mm. oh yeah, we want BIPOC people, LGBTQI people in the, in the conversation, but it's always from the, from the walls to outside. Mm -hmm. No, to the outside to show the the clean face, but inside yeah. is right, inside right. inside is inside is not like that. No, so uh, I I I think that's I, I think that is a, is kind of like a something that I want to advocate to actually to have a contemporary uh, representation. No, uh, because the conception we have a misconception of what Latino culture it is. Mm -hmm. And it's for different factors. No, one of the reasons is, uh, for example, we got a lot of uh, um, farmer workers and population from the rural areas in Latin America that came here to work. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that automatically uh, the system 
thinks or creates that that is the, our only representation, but we have like a contemporary cultural representation. No, just go to Mexico. No, Mexico in the 1920s was the avant-garde city, was the place to go and still, no, right. then Peru, Chile, Brazil, no, uh, we have a, uh, people that got the Nobel Prizes, no, so so we have like a lot of, of uh, contributions beyond that exoticism, no, and so okay. I I, th I think I think uh, we have to uh, we have to f I don't want to say fight because fighting fighting we don't go anywhere, no. I think we have to put things clear on the table, no. Mm -hmm. This is what it, this is what it is, and you take it or not, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's so amazing that you're kind of taking these situations where maybe you're you're being tokenized or maybe you're there looking for, but then you're turning it into an opportunity to, you know, create more richness and, and to say what you want to say, really. Um, one of the things that we were thinking about is what parts of your work do you feel like because they're three, seen through like the dominant culture um, get don't get noticed as much like what nuances to your work do you feel like get left out of the larger conversation about your work i i think um i think the latin american f the latino factor no uh, yeah um and is uh, when i when i was in doing my my mfa at hunter college um you know i was showing my paintings and all my uh, classmates they just moved to New York to join the program and they, they were like, oh, this is not contemporary. And I was like, but what contemporary means? And they were like, no, this is folkloric. This is Latin American. They were under, category, under categorizing my work. Right. And they, they, in their minds, because they didn't know me that much, they thought that they I just came from Peru and I had already more than 15 years in New York, doing work with all the communities and exhibiting my art in the city and playing with my band. Right. No, so, um, because you see a lot of, a lot of uh, artwork made by people from other places. If you change their last name to a Latin American last name, they're gonna say, oh, this is folkloric. But because their last name is Schultz or Smith or any other last name is like oh it's so contemporary. So but but that but that happens a lot. And on the other hand, um, what I see problematic with the contemporary art mm -hmm. made in Peru is that there is a political agenda. There is a cultural political agenda that everything must be about the political situation that we had in the eighties. Everything has to be related with some kind of like a social conscious movement. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think so. I don't think so because why, what happened is that, uh, this is the uh, organization, no? My tape measure, the, this is the organization. Yeah. And the organization, and this is the, I want to show in a metro card. This is, uh, <laughs> this is the, this is, this is the organization and this is the, um, let's say Latino and queer and black and woman of color mm -hmm. artist. No, when they join forces to do a project, the organization wants to take measures of the artist's work. Oh, Latino artists do work about Immigration. Okay. Yeah. 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 No. Uh, do work about shamanism, the mysticism yeah. of the yeah. Incas. Oh, queer artists. What about your sexual identity? Oh, black artists. What about the prison system and the uh, and slavery? No. Woman artists. What about your identity as a woman in the market? So, uh, and what what happens if there is a black artist that does uh, just colorful, color filled expressionism. Right. Or if there is a, a queer artist that makes a noise, noise mm -hmm. landscapes, you know? So they are a little bit uh, put it on the side because, right. because their work doesn't 
accomplish the political agenda of the institution. And Definitely. that happened, and that happens because uh, we don't have already a representation on the table in mm -hmm. the boards, no, uh, in a, in a leadership positions, no. So, uh, yeah. and and then I am the organization that runs programs for kids, and then when we want to raise money, we take a photo of the Latino kid and we put it on the picture. Don't they ask money? <laughs> it's true or not? Yeah. Definitely, yeah. I think you know. So, uh, so it's, it's 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 very complex, no. But but the thing is, I don't feel that the solution is complain and make like, oh, si se, si se puede, la lucha sigue. No, I, I think I think it's like, okay, we the first day we met, we mm -hmm. have a conversation at the same level, parallel, parallel, right. no. So. I, I I want that. I I want that because I'm I'm really getting a little bit tired and on my nerves about that situation. No, mm -hmm. I understand. Um, definitely, Black, Indigenous, and people of color in the United States specifically have been marginalized and like put into these boxes. And usually, when they do get a chance to kind of like show their artwork or show the work that they do, they're often expected to perform under like specific like guides, like you mentioned. Like it has to be like a political yeah. agenda. Yeah, it has to be like. Oh, if you're a queer person, you have to do queer art. If you're a black person, you have to do art that relates to your experiences being a black person. And I think that definitely is something that, like as a whole, we're still struggling with just to get by. And I, I definitely like your thoughts when you explained how like having the representation is really important because it kind of like it changes like the level. It plays it changes the playing field basically. Kind of like somebody will see your artwork and they're not going to be like, oh, I'm just thinking of a Latino artist. Or I'm just thinking of this. They're going to be like more open to the artwork and not just be like, oh, you're this type of artist or you're that type of artist because of Well, and also like innately, if mm -hmm. I am from Egypt and I am from America, like my artwork is Egyptian American art. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I don't have to be uh, talking about any of right. those themes because every single experience that I've lived is gonna inform the way that I do that art. You know, so even yeah. if all I'm doing is doing like a very traditional style uh, of art or like a very like Western style of art, it's the experiences that I bring are going to inform that art. Right, right. Oh, probably not. No, <laughs> probably, probably, probably not because uh, you said Egyptian American art, but, uh, but uh, the art is an ecosystem, no? So yeah, I am Peruvian and I am American citizen too. I pay taxes since the year of 2000. So mm -hmm. so I can I have all the rights to say that I am an American. Right. And I am an American Peruvian artist, no? Uh, but sometimes my art is out of the picture in Peru because I don't produce the work there. Mm. Right. So, so maybe, maybe my work is more re relevant for the art ecosystem in the United States. The yeah. same, no. So maybe you, you, you say Egyptian American, but probably your art is more relevant, more relevant for the ecosystem of the arts in the United States than in Egypt. To make yeah, it in no. Egypt, you yeah. probably have to build a, a career there and and a you know what? Uh, I think what no, what you're saying is exactly right because we do have a problem as well with people from diaspora claiming home or claim you know when they mm -hmm. don't necessarily live the experiences there as well. I do think though that being not American and living in the United States does change the way that you approach your own identity because you don't ever, like some people aspire to Americanness, right? They want to say like, I'm just American and that's it. And other people say, no, like I embrace this other part of my identity. And I, and I want to clarify that it's not just like American, this other part, you know, also influences how I see the world. I see uh, um, there are two artists from France from the mm -hmm. early 20th century, yeah. Marcel Duchamp and Yves Tanguy. Marcel Duchamp is a, a Dadaist artist and Yves Tanguy is a painter, is one of the uh, beginners of the surrealist painting movement. 
Both of them are labeled in American museums as Americans, not as French. How, how they became, and probably they live less years than us in the United States. So how and why they became American artists and we have to label ourselves as Egyptian artists, Mexican American, mm -hmm. Peruvian American, so why? Hold on, it's a race thing? It's a, it's a, uh, are we entering into the race problematic because they are Europeans and in some way United, St United States is the extension of Europe? Yes, it is. Or, or, the, or, or the extension of Western culture. And we have in our genes, in our heritage, the opposite. I, I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm, to me it's very problematic because if you review the WPA, the World Progress Administration, the Federal Art uh, Program during the WPA, there are not only one, closer to 200 artists that they were immigrants from Lithuania. Right. And all of them are listed as American artists. I understand it's a different was a different time. At that time was the time of the melting pot, no? The melting pot means that everybody that came to the United States has to became American. No uh, men, religious men from Eastern Europe, they shave, no, they have to look American. Uh, right. They don't they don't teach their native language to their kids because they don't want because they want their kids to become Americans. They don't want their kids to suffer discrimination. Uh, mm -hmm. Latinos keep doing that probably until the 80s, early 90s, uh, you know, so, so everybody became American. Now the conversation is different. Now the conversation is, oh yeah, let's show diversity, inclusion. So now we start to talk about, oh, immigrant artists, Egyptian American, Mexican American, right. Peruvian American. So, so now already we are in the, we are like on, on a skateboard, not right now of that <laughs> it's like, uh, so so and we entering in the we entering in the race of of american culture with our own identity but when i'm talking about our own our own identity i'm still seeing problematic uh, the the boxes no mm -hmm. uh, the boxes i uh, it's a uh, um, I don't know. Uh, I feel that uh, my 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 work is not really related related culturally mm -hmm. uh, with the work made by other Latinos and specifically the work but made made by Latinos born in the United States. Right. No, we actually we are allies. We work together. We are part of the same. Uh, Rasa, however you want to call it, movement, but at the same time, it's important to say that I'm originally from Peru. No, I'm originally from Peru. That's why a little, a little bit bothers me when institutions without actually do their homework mm -hmm. to know that I'm from Peru, that I'm from Lima, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, they ask, "Oh, Latinx artists." Right, right. No, so it's like, yeah, but you know, there, there is, there is more. No. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Even the even the term I know we we need to move on, but even the term <laughs> American is problematic in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, well, because... it's, it's, yeah, well, it's... <laughs> no, it's true. No, 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 it's true because, like, it's just important to like you know bring this out to the forefront because a lot of people may not necessarily understand. Like, sure, some of us might have like similar thoughts or just have like a sense of familiarity with a the theme. Mm -hmm because as somebody who's not typically seen as maybe quote unquote American, we're used to kind of being subjected to these lenses that all these institutions hold us to. So like you said, definitely, sure, you might have, you may be invited to do artwork or, you know, interviewed or whatever, but then they'll like put you in this like box, I say, I guess, and they may not necessarily recognize that you're like a Peruvian American artist. And I think it's uh, a disservice to you because like that definitely is like, I know that when you started um, your art training, like your art studies, it was in Lima, Peru, you went to school. Yes over there and then it was afterwards that you came to the US to pursue your education and art as well but it just kind of like washes that out in a sense if we don't acknowledge that yeah and uh and you know we have been using the uh, we have to also understand in which context we are using the mm -hmm. the terms no uh, uh, 
there is a lot of uh, Latinx kids that just finished high school and their identity is being Latinx. Right. And also me as a Latino, as a Latino man, mm-hmm. you know, I have to uh, em- embrace the, 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 the Latino queer struggle. You mm-hmm. know, and that's why I totally support those kids that identify themselves as Latinx. I totally yeah. support that, but doesn't, but that doesn't makes me uh, Latinx. And, and uh, I can use it if, if I want. Why not? But the thing is, uh, when an institution came and without ask my name, they just right. put me Latinx. It's like, hey, wait, they slap a label on you. <laughs> yeah, no, so, yeah. Why? So you should call me American. <laughs> it's that balance of like saying like I belong here, but also like I'm not assimilating into the dominant culture necessarily, right? Like of saying like, yeah. you know, what is American and and do I necessarily want to? Yeah, and in in, uh, in Latin America, all the all the Latin American artists, all mm-hmm. the Latin American artists, uh, many of them, uh, I will say, white Latin American artists, mm-hmm. you know, uh, all of them, they they complain uh, when United States use the term American for the <laughs> artists, no? They're like, oh yeah, yeah but yeah. we are American too, we are American too. And that's, <laughs> that's, that sounds very funny because they, in some way, they, they, they want to be part of, 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 right. of, of the, I don't the hegemonic know, culture. Uh, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know? like, it's like dominant. Yeah, yeah. but oh. what, uh, what they don't know, or many people uh, doesn't take in consideration that, um, you know, um, Terminologies have a different origin, no? Uh, people from Ireland, when their families were traveling to the United States, they say, my family, uh, America, America. No, Europeans, no, we're going to America. Uh, it's not, they, 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 were, they were not denying the other mm-hmm. countries. They were just, uh, it's a colloquial, a colloquial way to say that they were traveling to another country continent so it's, it's not belong it's, it's not it's not that we want to be better than the other ones so we we no 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 not not yeah. at all no so yeah but people are still getting offended no american is a continent <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but going off identity and a little bit let's go a little bit more into history i know we both noticed that like while we were reviewing your gallery we noticed mm-hmm. that indigenous history plays a large part in like influencing your work um, I, indigenous history. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was really struck by the piece, the the, the three paintings, uh, the tragedy of the corn. I noticed that you focused a lot on corn on your pieces, and I just wanted to mm-hmm. ask you, like, how do you view corn in your artwork in the larger history of U.S. relationship with indigenous people? Yeah, and this piece was made during my residency at the Rubenstein Arts Center mm-hmm. uh, at Duke University. And you know when you have uh, when you work an artist in residence program, you have to be specific, no? Right. It's not like in your studio, no. You go to your studio, no. You like chill out, and you no. In a <laughs> residency, you actually you do work specifically. And mm-hmm. I was in I, I was in an uh, in an academic setting because right. it's the uh, art space of the university. And for this specific case, I want to talk, have a conversation about my identity, yeah. no, all Latino, all Latin American identity. And uh, I was thinking, which is actually an icon, a picture, a product right. that can represent all of us? Because rice is not the rice. I don't think maybe the potato, but uh, not really. Right. Uh, the corn, the corn, no. The corn is uh, also the corn also represents technology, mm-hmm. no, because native people they mix different plants and during yeah. the time they generated this product. Represent if it represents technology it represents knowledge and if there is knowledge 
there is philosophy. No, uh, all the pillars of the human being: knowledge, philosophy, knowledge, mathematics. So, uh, and I, I, that's why I want to make these pieces about the the corn and how has been manipulated in our contemporary times. Yeah, exported, and no matter no matter what, the corn is very important for American food. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, mm -hmm. and and that's true. It's at and, the base of everything. The production of of corn, we use it to make like corn syrup, which we add to like all of our stuff everything. for some reason. We add yeah. it to snacks, cereals, drinks. You know, it's just in everything. Yeah, yeah. They all, <laughs> I. I, I like to make tacos, and uh, yeah. and but I only like the the corn tortilla. Oh, I'm the same way. <laughs> yeah, that that's taco. That's a taco. No, like, I do tacos, tacos with everything. But I want to tell you a funny story about tacos in a minute. But uh, so uh, and I have a, a some scholar from Duke from the Latin American Art Department, Miguel Martin. I forgot his name, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, he told me that he just came back from China. He was in China, and we were talking about how popular food is also related with displacement, some poverty, the poor people food that became, uh, you know, like like a uh, very right. trendy. You no, know? and he told mm -hmm. me that that he, in China, he was doing the research in China, and mm -hmm. he found these gigantic plantations of corn. And people with not too many uh, money, people, poor people, they were eating more corn than rice in China. That's really interesting. And I yeah. was like, oh, wow. No, so so this piece, this piece, uh, I want in some way to talk about that, um, that uh, dramatic, it's, for me it's a very dramatic piece, no? Right, right. Uh, in the first panel, we have all this process of this mystical, mystical creation of this product from the gods in a metaphorical way. And I picture a woman in the, in the bottom mm -hmm. to represent fertility, mother air, mother land, no, the, the, the soil, the soil. No, but I have to represent in a human form, no? So she's observing and watching all this process. And then the conquistador, the guy with the helmet in the picture with the cross, mm -hmm. came into all this, uh, in the landscape, in this landscape, in this picture, okay. and is having a conversation with a bad identity, with a bad person, that is selling to him the secrets of the corn. This bad person is not a European, it's someone from our lands. Don't forget, don't forget, don't exoticize our people, don't mystify our people. We also, we have the good ones and the bad ones. No, we also, you know, same happens in Africa, everywhere. So he's getting the secret of the corn from a bad source and then they just producing the corn in series right a mass production of corn put it in the boat and take it away this is the dramatic history that happens in this painting um, what i have been doing a lot is that anywhere i'm going to do my work i incorporate in my painting the soil Okay. So this painting has Duke soil. Oh, yeah, I remember cool. reading about that. Yeah. 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 How you would mix the paint with the soil when you would use it. Yes. Like to see that there's like some more texture in the piece yeah. that you have here. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like a, a I want to, I want to, um, in this specific work that I made at the, the Rubenstein, the Ruby, the way how they call it. I want to I want to step away from the political immigration work I was doing at the power plant, and I want I want I want to do it more cultural, no more like yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I like this piece. Yeah, it's like when I look through all your work, this one like stuck out to me, and I was like, oh, this is really interesting. We have to pick this one to talk about. <laughs> so definitely, we just wanted to like pick your brain and just kind of see what your thoughts were about it. We're on about it. <laughs> 
And on that note, um, in one of your previous interviews, you said, and forgive me for quoting you, but with syncretism or the blending of cultures, pre-Hispanic Peruvian art became mixed with colonial painting. There are a lot of hidden icons and messages in Catholic iconography that were painted by native peoples. During the period of colonization, when natives walked into a church, they weren't allowed to dance. They weren't allowed to talk. They weren't allowed to pray but they could see the representation of their beliefs in these paintings. And so what really struck me about it was how you were describing painting as an act of resistance, um, as an act of resisting perhaps cultural genocide um, or of preserving culture in a context where maybe it's being wiped out. Um, so <laughs> how would you say uh, that indigenous ways of approaching both art and resistance um, have influenced your work. So I, I grew up in Lima and in, in a context that everything was very political. Mm -hmm. No, uh, my generation, no, I'm talking about uh, the 90s. We were between two fires, the government, the military, mm -hmm. and the terrorist organizations. And we were in the middle. We were in the middle. No, and so so how how you can express yourself and don't get killed by the government or by right. the terrorist organization? No, mm -hmm. um, this is let, let's put that concept in one side for a second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the other side, I believe that painting is important and crucial for all the nations. No, uh, in painting communicates and also is a document of the history of the country. A country that doesn't have a, like a kind of like a national gallery, uh, like a painting salon, mm -hmm. like a painting museum is losing a lot of their histories because the narrative is important in the painting. The painting can be the most abstract painting, the most conceptual painting, but always there is going to be a narrative. And that narrative is our common history. Now, if we mix both together, both concepts, uh, to me, painting is, is my resistance because mm -hmm. painting is very easy. It's a, it's a, it's a, a practice that is very easy to just let it go and give it away and don't paint anymore. No, uh, there is a Peruvian painter called Jose Sabogal from the 1930s, 1920s. Mm -hmm. And he said that the modern, the modern times, the modern era in the arts in Latin America and specifically in Peru mm -hmm. started when the Europeans came to the continent. No, uh, they brought technology, but also we have our knowledge. Right. Oh no, is it frozen? Oh no. Hold on. We'll figure it out, y'all. <laughs> You're so, so, I was like leaning in <laughs> just like a. <laughs> You're gonna like see better, hear better. <laughs> I'm ready. I really thought he was like pausing for, for effect for a second. Uh, this is such a beautiful piece. I think we talked about this before, how vivid the colors are in all of the works. Yeah, this piece is titled Misty Sake. Oh, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Oh, you're back. I'm back. I'm back. That 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 was that, that was the Someone, uh, okay, so, so that was sabotage, sabotage. <laughs> uh, okay, no, so what I'm saying is that, so this painter said that, so these, these people brought the, some kind of like a technology, but we have our knowledge, so right. we start to, in some way, we continue making our art using their technology, that in this case is oil painting. So we continue. We we continue. It's a very it's a very it's a very positive way to see history. No, so we are using the Trojan horse. We are using the other people technology to 
continue with our heritage, with our history. And I want to tell you that that doesn't happen and was impossible in the United States because the people that came to from the south of the United States to the to Argentina were mm -hmm. Catholics and the Catholics were iconoclasts. You know, you go to a Catholic temple and you see all these pictures, you know, the saint, the virgin, the painting, yeah. etc. And we were influenced by the Baroque, you no, know, the, the Baroque art, you no, know? so a mm -hmm. lot of like elements in one picture. But what happened on the north of America, we got um, Protestants and Christians, they, 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 they didn't use any picture, any, any visual, any visual um, signs to mm -hmm. communicate their ideas, no? So, so, so that's, that's, that's why um, syncretism is, is very important. And I believe in that because it's a way how we have been able to keep our culture alive and is present. When we talk about Latin American culture, when we talk about uh, the Incas, the Mayas, the Aztecs, mm -hmm. we don't talk about the past. We talk about the present. Whoever, oh, actually, I want to say that also to Egypt, uh, because we have uh, an artist from Egypt here in our conversation, no? So whoever talk about uh, Egypt is only the pyramids and Cleopatra, that's, you know? Right, right. It's not part of the past. We are present. We are here. So how we keep this alive? In my case, with my painting. No, and also in my music, why not? No, so this is kind of the idea why I totally embrace and support syncretism in the arts. When I was in Hunter College, my my classmates they were like, "Oh, you have to be more obscure. You have to be <laughs> like less less folkloric, less Latin American." Mm -hmm. For what? That's not my culture. Right. I like I like abstract painting. Go to my website; you're gonna see like a lot of abstract paintings. Yeah. Of course, I like color field. I like minimalism. I like techno, minimal music. But again, again, we are using this uh, technology from Western to keep alive. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah it's definitely important to use like what we have, at, what we have, you know, available, mm -hmm. but use it to you like talk about our own narrative to keep our own history and our own culture, you know, in the, in the, like, out in, out in the open, just kind of keep it alive and keep it out there. So with this, um, I wanted to switch gears to your other project that you did called What I Left and What I Brought. Oh yeah. And I, it's like a, it's like our one of the biggest pieces. We were just like, oh, we're so excited to get to this. Yeah. And I just want to let you know that I definitely found like a sense of familiarity with your work because of the themes you explore about the immigrant experience. And I was actually curious um, and I did more research online and I found out that there were some more aspects that were not in the in the gallery that you have on your website. Yeah, I read about the displacement potluck, and I wanted to know if you could um, give us a little bit more information about that. I found that really interesting. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, so uh, I, I I love to cook. No, I love to cook, and and one one of the things that uh, I I uh, actually I like from from American culture mm -hmm. is the potlucks. Amazing, no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. amazing. No? amazing. I, 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 I remember in New York, uh, you know, uh, with my friends, we have potlucks all the time in this yeah. space called Local Pro, and, uh, and it's, a, it's a good way to to have conversations and sharing. And also in, in punk culture, you no, know, mm -hmm. always in the punk houses, you know, there are these dinners and potlucks and, and communal kitchens. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, I came with uh, this idea, this idea that I want to introduce that practice into my artistic uh, practice. And, and uh, I have this potluck called the Displacement Potluck mm -hmm. that I invite people from different backgrounds to bring a dish related with an history of displacement and immigration. For example, uh, you got evicted from your art studio and across the street, uh, they used to sell these Italian pizza, New York style that you like. So you mm -hmm. maybe want to 
bring that pizza to the potluck, or maybe you remember your grandma from, I don't know, from Easter Europe making these cookies, or you want to bring those cookies, right. uh, you know, or, or et, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so um, we were able to make it uh, the power plant at Duke, and we have people from Israel, from Argentina, born in Raleigh, from oh, China, okay. from... Uh, New York, from different places, and and uh, and I and I think that was a that was a very very fantastic experience. I wanted to do that in Palm Beach in my recent artist in residency oh, with okay. the with the New York Art Weekend um, program, but we were not able to do it because the the COVID situation, but, right, right. but, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward, no, maybe, maybe like a virtual potluck. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going to be that fun because you're going to, you're not going to be able to smell and taste other people's right. food. But yeah, yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to, to do it again. No. And, and, uh, you know, I like, I like that. I, I like, uh, potlucks and people just naturally play guitar and sing yeah, this kind, yeah. this kind of gatherings. No, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm dreaming. I'm, I'm dreaming to, to have my own version of Thanksgiving Day, they know I always I always, yeah. I always spend Thanksgiving Day in other people's houses, but at, so I, I want to make my own version, no, like the yeah. the this place, the immigrants Thanksgiving Day, um, play music, and you know I, I like uh, um, I like that. I I, I think it's a, it's a nice uh, social practice uh, activity. No. Yeah, definitely enjoyed reading about that because I was like, oh wow, I wish I you know I wish I could have found this in the I think like on the English articles that talked about the the work, the project, and I thought that was really cool and it like stuck out to me because you're definitely like, you open up like the project, the artwork and the installation to like every, people who are coming in and just sharing their foods with you. And just like this like, cultural, cultural exchange that is going on. I thought that was really beautiful. Yeah, you have to put labels, no? It's spicy. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of spicy, no sugar, no sugar, gluten free, gluten free, right. gluten, free gluten, gluten free tamales. <laughs> uh, I think we were both so kind of absorbed by this installation that you did. Um, we we spent a lot of time talking about it and what we wanted to ask you about, and we were talking about um, your use of Instagram uh, before we started. Uh, I crawled through your Instagram. I really dug through there and I found um, a video of the installation yeah. um, where you have this narration. I'm gonna read another, I'm gonna read more of your words. <laughs> I grew up listening, all these histories about Contiki crossing the Pacific Ocean to the Polynesia or the Vikings traveling to the Americas way before Columbus. For them, probably the modern conception of borders does not exist. And I just, <laughs> I love that you that you said that along with this installation. Um, and I wanted your opinion on, like, what do you think the function of borders is? Oh, well, the the situation is that in some way they have been exist. You no, know? um, yeah. Uh, let's 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 go. Um, they were created to protect places from invaders. They were created to uh, protect your church or your religious temple to be uh, devastated and, you know, like destroyed by people with other beliefs. And they have been exist just to for political agendas. No, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, no. But in the history, of uh, 20th century and 21th century that is has been um, more political became more political the conversation more mm -hmm. more political and super racist super super racist 100 yeah. percent racist no um, yeah if we talk about immigration we have to go to talk a, li a little bit not a little bit a lot that is a lot of racist problem there is a very racist problem, uh, you know. It's an it's it's kind of like a, a an an imposition of some kind of like a white supremacism, right? You know, and happens happens all over the place. In my, in my city in Lima, happens and happens. You have these fancy white neighborhoods, 
and then they build a wall because they don't want the poor people, that mostly is people of color, mm -hmm. just walk through the, in, into their streets. They are a, the beaches that were public, they are building these judge clubs for people with money. You know, uh, you have these fancy malls built with a waterfront view to the ocean, and they actually making these borders because if you are a, an indigenous people, a people of color, they, they kind of let you in. And uh, so it's very, I, I'm, I'm seeing this over and over and becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and more problematic. Right. And honestly, from my position right now, the solution is that we need to get into their tables. No, we need to get into the, uh, you know, uh, it's not about escape that system. It's again, Trojan horse, Trojan horse. Yeah. It's about enter to the system and from the system show our representation. Is I don't think it's a good business to be a paria right now. Right now, no, it's not. It's, a, we have to do it the other way. The other way, we have knowledge. We have knowledge. I'm seeing very problematic of that conversation. You know, to today, today, for example, uh, you know, by um, I was. I was looking this video with my kid. No, he's doing some kind of like a school from work. And the teacher was showing this book. And, and the book was about, oh, my name is Juan and I live in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I have a television. And on Sundays I watch television and I and I uh, have an skateboard. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Jose. I live in a, in the mountains in Mexico and I don't wear tennis. I wear sandals and I don't play with my skateboard. I, I am a farmer worker or whatever. I, I, mm -hmm. I, 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 I harvest corn and, and, and that, yeah. Okay. I understand. Maybe that's the history of a lot of people, but that book is not helping us. And, and it's, it's not helping the, the Latino kids to understand their identity. No, because we have great Mexican artists. Mexico has been the avant-garde for years. Diego Rivera, you know, Frida Kahlo, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and I'm talking to you the most popular, the most romanticized icons yeah. of Mexican culture, but you know, music, music, come on, music, Mexico, television, the television industry in Mexico is gigantic. So it's a country super contemporary, super avant-garde, you no, know? right. and, and, and Probably the same happens if we talk about oh, Brazil, for example. No, and I don't know that much about the Mediterranean area, but I'm sure it's like that. No, so so that that's, that is what I'm saying. We have to change the perception of what a Latino it is or what a person of color it is. And, no, just I, I believe in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that's like something that spent a lot of time i'm sure omar you have too like thinking yeah. about you know our identity and and how we're presented in the media and i think that one of the things that i've learned is um that there's a difference between um the knowledge that you present for your people and then the knowledge that you present for 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 anyone else right yeah. Um, yeah. And and I think I think you mentioned it as in one of your interviews about how you, your art is for is for the people. Depends the check. <laughs> <laughs> but but and and I, actually I think that that makes sense because you know. I may not feel the need to defend who I am or who my people are to people who look down on me, but maybe I feel the need to enrich other children who come from like, you know, like just to talk about myself, like who come from Egypt about our history and our culture and our modern art, right? And to make sure that they're getting that information from like Egyptian, from people who know the diversity of the work that we have to bring, you know? Yeah, and also uh, my if if I have if we if I have do we have time ten minutes how many more we got some time yeah so the thing is like, uh, <laughs> so what uh, about uh, advices uh, my advice is uh, you know it's very common oh yeah let's call an artist or let's call an artist of color a Latino artist mm -hmm. to do 
uh, an art, a community piece, community artwork, art for the people. Right. And and I was like, if you get that invitation, send an invoice. Get paid for that. Right. Definitely. Yep. No, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it happens, so, it happens so often. I'll hear stuff. Get like get get yeah. paid for. Get get paid for that. Get paid for that because what happened is like, um, we are delivering knowledge for less than the minimum wage. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So uh, you know, and 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 I, I, I don't, I don't think it's fair. No, it's like, it's like, you, it's like, um, come on, no, it's like, hey, hey, Omar, um, can you can can you tell your grandma to send me my uh, her tortillas recipe? No, <laughs> and then and then you like send it to this person, and then the person opens a brunch on Sundays. Oh my God! <laughs> you know, it's like uh, using your recipe uh, because it has a very diverse diner in the name. In the, uh, it's like no man. <laughs> it's like but but people no. only want that diverse diner too if it has a white face, right? Because like if yeah. The, if yeah 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 no those those tortillas on a on a um, you know those those tortillas in a in a branch are gonna cost you ten bucks, but if you sell it with your carrito in the market, it's probably one dollar, two dollars. Right. Yeah. So so we have to end with that dynamic. Definitely. It's not good, it's not good for our economy. We want to send our kids to college. You know, we, we don't want our kids with that, you know. But I but I have a lot of hope because right now in the area where I live, mm -hmm. there are a lot of uh, Latino kids finishing high finishing uh, college. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. and uh, in North Carolina, finishing college, and is the probably their uh, second generation, first generation finishing college. So in the next, in the next five ten years, they're gonna start to get uh, important professional positions. No, that happens already in New York. That happens already in Chicago, in the big cities. Yeah. But in North Carolina specifically, no yet. Uh, in the area where I live, I don't know how it is in Charlotte. In Charlotte, but but definitely, uh, definitely have a lot of hope because here there are there are great programs. You no, know? uh, all the schools are are doing great job. Organizations like Mariposas, for example, is an organization mm -hmm. that works with uh, Latino girls. Then you have El Centro Hispano. And there is a guy called Antonio. He's really cool. No, he has been doing a lot of work teaching Spanish and doing some kind of like a community work. He's an artist too. So I I, I see that um, is is the um, it's like we just start to to learning how to ride a bike. No, we still have training wheels. No? Right. <laughs> no, but I have I have a lot of hope. I I don't think I don't think so. It's a battle. That we are going to lost. I think it's totally, it's totally the inverse. But it's in our hands, no? It's in our hands. Yeah. Wow, that's so profound. I think we're just both. I know. <laughs> we're I'm just, just like both taking, sitting here. Just taking the message in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like a moment of silence for the. <laughs> yeah, silence. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like yeah. This is it's a it's a it's a job. You know, I I I did I did a lot of stuff for free. I been I been in, I I been in in situations that I. I did stuff for free, and then I feel like, oh wow, these people is getting taking advantage of the situation. And but then you became a professional. You learning from those. But the yeah. thing is, if I went through that, if I went through that, and that took me ten years, I can tell that to someone younger, and it's gonna right. take to this person ten years, probably one or two. You no, know, the idea is like we have yeah. to speak. We have to like yeah. make things faster. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's serious. Mm -hmm. Do we have no. time to talk about a little bit more? If you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, let's see. Did we want to bring up um, one of the pieces that you've done, Protest Singer? Oh, yeah, I love that one. I love that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, it's it, it was one. Of, it's one of my favorites, too. Um, <laughs> Do you want to talk about it a little bit? I'd love to hear yes. more from you about it. I know yes. that, I know that you have some history with, sorry, I know I'm interrupting. I know you have some history with music. You mentioned that you're active in music. You're a musician. You actually have music that's been published. 
Yeah. And um, I just wanted to know if that's like related to some of the pieces you do on art. Yeah, this piece, um, I, I, I go into concerts all the time. Well, not right now, but like, right. I try to go to concerts. <laughs> Be safe, everyone. And, yeah. And uh, from the local artists, from the Chapel Hill, Durham, Carboro area, mm -hmm. there is uh, uh, a queer artist called Severed Fingers. Severed Fingers? Severed? Mm -hmm. No? Severed, yeah. Yeah, Several yeah. fingers, and uh, Jesse is the name of the singer. And I went to the concert, and I cry listening <laughs> yeah. to Several Fingers music. Oh, I have to look it up now. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I can send to you the links later. They have a song about a that a. You, you was expecting me to be a better person or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, they have a song about uh, friends that are in uh, hospital beds. Uh, they mm -hmm. have a song called Puerto Rico. And man, that was so intense. It was like, and I, and I, I, uh, I, I took photos, no, of, of the yeah. band. And then I, I made this, this, this painting inspire on, on several fingers and I, I know the singer, so uh, no. Uh, I invite Severed Fingers to perform at at my show at Duke, uh, the Power Plant, but they were not able to make it. But uh -huh. uh, but yeah, it's it's about that. No, and and I think I think they have like a, I I think they have. A, is that my phone? Sorry. <laughs> I, so I'm sorry. Sorry. I think they have a, some kind of like a Christian background, and then they left that life. So they came from an area of the United States that was very right. traditional. So you have to look for the for their music. Severed fingers from a uh, Durham, North Carolina. So and uh, this piece, no, yeah, and uh, and then there is a, a singer called uh, Brooke Pride Moore. It's a punk singer from Brooklyn. I, I play a show okay. with him here in Local 506. And he has a song called Protest Singer. And, and the song Protest Singer, you know, it's like something like, I'm not your protest singer. And in some mm -hmm. way, when, I, when I'm listening to, to Brooke's song, I'm thinking on Severed Fingers, you no. Know? Yeah. So yeah, so it's like yes, uh, this painting is it's, I like it. It's like it's, a, it's like this size. It's on a small painting. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good one. It's great to hear you so passionate about that. <laughs> you're like so enthusiastic about this. It's really nice. Yeah. I was really curious just to see more about this piece. I know Donna said that she definitely wanted to bring this up mm -hmm. um, during the interview because it's one of her favorite pieces. Yeah. No, I and and to hear you mention all these um, artists that we can explore to now, I'm so excited. Like, oh, please yeah. send me that after. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm de def definitely, I'm going to send to you the um, the links to to their music. Yeah, it's on Bandcamp. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, perfect. Um, I think that's about it for us. Um, all right. So I can't uh, believe I can't believe yeah, like, hours. Like, I feel like so quickly. You can go on. <laughs> uh, when 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 you are when you are in college and a class that is like we are like uh twenty minutes more. Uh, right. <laughs> no, I, I, so I remember those are philosophy classes, man. They were like oh, oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now um, I enjoy. But, no, but we wanted to thank you so much for you joining us today. To um I learned so much we got to talk about amazing things today and, and your work is so incredible so thank, thank you, you so for much. sharing with us yeah thanks, Rana. thanks Ma. Thank they so are uh, the um so uh, for the people that is listening to this uh, talk uh, check my instagram no <laughs> yes <Resort>. highly <laughs> recommend <Yes. laughs> google, google me <laughs> no, no but tell uh, them your instagram yeah yeah, uh, Renz Ortega, you see, it's like my name, no? And, uh, and Renz Ortega Art, no? And uh, you can look also for my music, just uh, Google my name on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. I think I actually found a video when I was like researching. I was like, Ran, I found the video of 
Renzo, but I think he's like performing, and I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I blame I, I, I yeah. music. I blame music. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And I, I hope we were supposed to be, uh, I was supposed to be to play a show organized by the bass player of Chocala in Charlotte. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, but didn't happen because of the situation. But okay. looking forward to visit you very soon. I have uh, music contacts there, and now I have your contacts. So, yeah, so please tell you, us when you're here. Yeah, yeah, when you're here. <laughs> yeah please don't, don't miss it. <laughs> All right. All right. We're gonna we're gonna say goodbye to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, please join us September twenty eighth at six thirty p.m. for uh, Chinese Girl Wants. Um, and thank you so much, Renzo. Um, and good night. Good night. Take care. Good Ciao. Night. Bye. Bye. Bye.